Well, thank you very much, Charles, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here the, as the guest of the Insurance and Actuarial Society of Glasgow uh, in association with the British Insurance Brokers uh, Association. And uh, uh, it's true that even at my age of 57 that you can learn new things this evening. I didn't realise that I was a political fetishist until Christine explained that to me earlier on. Uh, and uh, I must admit that although we've had a fiscal commission that uh, carefully studied the, all the options, I thought all the options are available to Scotland so far as currency was concerned, and including a Nobel uh, Economics Prize winner, Sir Jim Murleys, uh, I must confess, ladies and gentlemen, at no stage have we given any consideration uh, to forming a currency union with Kazakhstan, Belarus, <laughs> and Russia. What a serious omission. Um, but seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to, to address my remarks in relation to the insurance sector, and I want to start off by making it absolutely clear that the insurance industry is one of the most important in Scotland. As the Enterprise Minister, uh, I know that uh, you are performing a terrific service to your customers and your clients. I used to be a solicitor. I was once uh, perhaps unwisely authorised by the Law Society of Scotland to conduct financial services. I have some experience, therefore, and understanding and involvement in transactions and work over the years when I ran my own business with the insurance sector. And we have some of the finest people in this industry, and I suspect many of you, without unduly buttering you up, are in this room. Uh, and we have a reputation throughout the world for financial services. And that reputation is based on the success of industry. Government shouldn't claim for itself the success that is achieved by people who are working in business. That success stems from your efforts, from your decisions, from the management of risk, uh, from the reputation that we enjoy. And I've seen in the travels in the, uh, the USA in particular that that reputation is one of probity coupled with business acumen and also an ability to see the job through, no matter how complex or challenging it may be. And the insurance industry, including general insurance and financial services and advice, is extremely important to Scotland. An illustration of this is found in the fact that, the, uh, that we have various industry leadership groups in the Scottish Government so that we engage with industry. Our policy, our strategy on sectors of industry such as oil and gas, renewables, textiles, tourism, uh, food and drink, uh, digital media is based on our relationship with industry, in most cases with industry leadership groups. And in financial services, our board, FISAB, uh, Financial Services uh, Advisory Board, is chaired by the First Minister. And at every meeting, unless there's some other uh, eventuality, the First Minister, John Swinney, and myself attend these meetings with some of the people at the very top of financial services in Scotland. And of course, Scotland has uh, four major insurance companies with their headquarters in Scotland. Uh, and we have a huge number, as has been remarked, of people working in the industry. Many here this evening working in large companies, many working in brokers' firms, many in legal firms such as, as Brodie's, uh, and many independent brokers throughout the country. So I wanted to say that the insurance industry is a major employer and extremely important to Scotland. And the reason why that's important is because I believe very strongly in the work that I've done over the past three years as Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism, that one of the ways that countries can be the most successful uh, and can succeed in economic terms to deliver the goods, to create jobs and employment, to provide opportunities for young people, is the closest possible engagement between government, uh, industry and also academia as a sort of triumvirate. And that is what I do most days. I do very little politics, and I'm not really that interested, frankly, in politics. Much of, much of the debate leaves me a bit cold. Uh, and therefore, our overriding desire is to see the continuing success of the insurance industry. And I think it's important to say that because it hasn't been made perhaps sufficiently clear, uh, and I, I wanted to make that clear. Now, um, let, let me address some of the, the, the main points, albeit briefly, perhaps we may come back to these in questions. Uh, as far as the EU is concerned, 
we're already in the EU. We've been in the EU for over 40 years. Uh, I don't think anyone seriously believes, as Christine said, that we would be ejected from the EU, nor is there any mechanism for that to happen. And in fact, uh, Greenland, that did leave the EU, had to have a referendum to uh, get out of the EU. Uh, the issue, I think, as Christine has fairly said, is, is more the terms of membership. And I was glad that that's been clarified because, uh, you know, I think any suggestion, as has been made, that we would be removed, unwelcome from the EU is, is ridiculous. Incidentally, the Commission today distanced themselves from uh, Mr. Barroso's comments. Uh, you may not have seen that, but although he yesterday made his comments, today I understand there has been a distancing uh, of the EU Commission officially from those comments. Um, so Scotland will continue to play an active part in the EU. There's something else that hasn't been mentioned, and that is there's another referendum plan on EU membership. And that referendum is to take place, apparently, in the UK. We don't think there's a necessity for it. My own view is have a referendum to make a change that you think is right. Don't have a referendum because you're afraid of what someone else might do, namely UKIP. Don't do it because you're afraid of the other guy. Do it because you believe fervently that what you're proposing <coughs> is right. And the EU referendum is extremely serious. And you may have seen leading companies that... Uh, particularly companies based from Japan and the USA expressing extreme concern about the possibility of the exit from the EU. Now, I don't think that even if there is an EU referendum, it's likely that uh, there will be an EU, uh, that there will be a vote against, but who knows? Who knows what may happen? Uh, and I think that is a, a fair point to make. Um, in addition, the EU, the Scotland has been a positive member in the EU, but we haven't got those great terms, I'm afraid, that Murdo has referred to. If you look at the deals that we've received on fishing and agriculture, especially the uh, agriculture compensation payments, you'll find that by any standard, the deal has been pretty poor. And that leads me to one of the arguments why I think independence for Scotland will be better for us all, which is that we will have a voice in Europe directly for Scotland to address our own issues. Secondly, regarding the currency issue, our fiscal commission uh, looked at four options, sterling the euro, the Scottish currency pegged to sterling, and uh, a flexible Scottish currency. And our fiscal commission, which comprised a series of experts in anyone's book, came up to the conclusion that although we could choose any of these options, that uh, uh, sterling would represent the best choice. Now, you'll have heard Alex Salmon, perhaps on television over the last few days, pointing out that um, the rest of the UK does a huge amount of business with Scotland, to the tune of £60,000 million a year. Uh, in fact, the rest of the UK uh, exports to Scotland more than the combination, the aggregate of exports uh, to China, Russia, India, South Korea, Japan and Brazil. And I just mention that to give you an illustration of the importance of that. Now, I put it to you this. Why would government in London want businesses in the rest of the UK to have to bear transaction costs coming from changing currency? Why would any government based uh, in London choose that option? And therefore, I think the question you should ask, ask yourself is, perhaps, uh, is it not the case that the reason why the Chancellor of the Exchequer and his uh, colleagues in the Labour and Liberal Party said what they did about the currency ruling it out, uh, was because they want to win the referendum campaign. They would say that, wouldn't they? Because they think by saying that as a political uh, 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 argument that that will scare off people from supporting independence. And I think there must be a strong measure of truth in that. Mervyn King, the former head of the Bank of England, did say to Alex Salmon that that view would change the day after a yes vote. That is what he said and that is what he should know. Nor did Mr. Carney, uh, uh, as has been said by a previous speaker, uh, rule out a currency union. That is not what he said. In fact, he said the opposite. He said we will make it work if that is what is to be done. Uh, nor, incidentally, are interest rates set by the UK government. They are set by the Bank of England independently. So there would be no loss of the power to set uh, interest rates. Now, I've addressed these briefly, and perhaps we can come back to them later, because uh, a lot more could be said. Um, but our position is we would 
keep the pound. We believe a sterling zone is in the interest of all. We have said that we believe that it should be kept for 10 years so there would be a stability involved. Uh, and we would remain keen members of the EU referendum. Our plan announced in our white paper, 670 pages, I trust you've all read it, uh, says uh, that we will, after a yes vote, negotiate with the UK government the terms of independence by April 2016 or thereabouts. That actually, that period of time of around about 18 months is around about the average period of time that the many countries that have become independent since 1945 have taken between the decision to vote yes and the Independence Day uh, to conclude the negotiations. That's a normal period and many senior respected economists uh, and jurists have said that that would present no difficulty at all. Um, the second set of arguments I want to address, ladies and gentlemen, since I've had to spend thus far uh, responding, I think, to some of the points that have quite reasonably been put thus far by previous speakers is this, that we think independence in Scotland is right, above all because only with the full levers that are open to a normal independent country are we able to run our own affairs as successfully as we should. Uh, we have over the past seven years in government, I hope, demonstrated that we have being competent in managing your affairs. We balance our budget. We can't borrow more uh, as uh, our colleagues can in London. Uh, they have borrowed actually since 2010 197,000 million pounds more than their estimates. That doesn't sound to me like uh, very prudent financial management. Why under independence would we be able to do better for Scotland? Well, here's three reasons. First of all, we'll have the levers open to a normal country. We can decide, for example, whether or not we choose to wage war or go to war or participate in a war. That's the choice that we have not enjoyed. Secondly, we will have all the powers over tax and taxation and spending that are open to a normal country. Uh, for example, the impact of taxation of uh, air passenger duty, of fuel duty in our petrol, uh, of VAT, at 20% uh, are pretty high. In fact, they're amongst the highest in the EU. And they all affect vital Scottish industry. Uh, I, I won't make specific promises about how we can tackle that, but the overriding objective is to give Scotland an economic advantage in business. Uh, and only through the possession of uh, the full range of powers can we do so. Um, second of all, I think our record over the past seven years has shown that we are able to manage the finances reasonably well and deliver for people in our society good quality services and a fair deal in terms of the things that we've done. Um, and thirdly, our engagement with business is extremely important. Perhaps more important than the money is the ability to respond quickly to situations that arise and with respect to Myrtle's colleagues in London, I'm not sure that that can be said about the UK in relation to vital interests, whether they're affecting industry or in relation to a regulation. Uh, and I could give you a great many examples of how that has operated in practice. So I think that it, uh, uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to us, it is the case that Scotland as an independent country and only by being an independent country, like after all, all normal countries in the world will be able to run our own affairs more effectively than we can at the moment. Our vision is relentlessly positive. We see that our closest friends uh, will be our neighbors and we will enjoy continued trade and cooperation with them uh, uh, as we do at the current time. We will align the regulatory systems and continue to honour all our obligations, whether they be under contract law or payment of pensions. That is, to use a legal phrase, a sine qua non uh, of any deal. Property rights must be respected. All obligations must be honoured. That is the only option. That is the option that we've set out in our white paper. Uh, and uh, I believe, I believe quite passionately that uh, in September this year, we have the opportunity 
to give future generations in Scotland the opportunity to have a better Scotland, a fairer Scotland and a more prosperous Scotland. So that is why I would urge you to vote yes in September. Thank you very much indeed.